In the new paradigm you are building, quantum physics plays a major role. Could you talk to us about this? Yes. Uh, it, actually, this idea that there is a source of causality in the universe, uh, apart from material causality. This, is the, this idea differentiates uh, spiritual traditions from materialists from the get-go. Uh, every spiritual tradition has a concept of uh, what can be summarized by the phrase downward causation. In this, material causation is upward from elementary particles to atoms to molecules to cells to brain, and brain makes everything that we are, like our consciousness. This is upward causation, cause rising upward from elementary particles. You can think of the spiritual tradition's downward causation as a nice opposition to this. So we'll, we'll keep the phrase, but let it not evoke the idea that we are talking about a majestic god in the outer space that is doling out act of downward causation. That picture is not, not impl implicit in this phrase or in this phrasing. Right. Uh, talk to us about the struggle between spirituality and science. Uh, I'd be glad to. This is a very old struggle. Right before Descartes, there was indeed a um, struggle was so lopsided in favor of Christianity that uh, it was impossible for a scientist to study the physical world without hindrance, without interference from the church. Descartes did a very smart thing. He divided reality into two parts, matter and mind. Mind is God's realm. Mind is the realm of the human being. Mind has free will in Descartes' construction. And matter then is, is uh, the realm of science, where science applies. And uh, scientists are free to uh, look at matter without the hindrance from church. Church has its domain. Scientists have their domain. In this way, Descartes tries to establish a truce. The truce uh, took a while, but eventually it came about and, and it went on for quite a while. What happened, however, is that Newton's work was so successful, so successful uh, in terms of finding the movement of matter, more and more uh, scientists started feeling, and in the 18th century, uh, Pierre Simon de Laplace expressed this very well, he said, um, we don't need that particular hypothesis, meaning that particular hypothesis of God in terms of describing how matter and the universe works. And more and more people started feeling that they don't need that particular hypothesis in, in talking about even realms which were given to uh, religion. Um, this started... Uh, with great force by the work of Darwin, who showed that, uh, in truth, um, animals are, 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 are machines. This is considered even by uh, Christianity. Uh, but we evolved from animals, according to Darwin's theory. So then we also are machines. So this separation of mind and matter cannot be maintained anymore in view of this Darwinist view of evolution. And so, very soon, um, this was being voiced. And uh, very soon, the view grew, especially, as I said, in the 1950s. Uh, the view grew that scientific materialism holds for everything in nature. Nature is materialist, materialistic. It's made of matter. Only material interactions count. Everything else is epiphenomenon. So it, it is true in general that scientists try to create a lot of confusion by attacking this, continuing to attack this straw god. God is a very simplistic notion of a majestic person sitting in a throne in outer space, doling out acts of downward causation. And it does sound ridiculous to any educated mind today, except that uh, of course, there is a lot of sympathy for such a simplistic God in some fractions of our society. We call them uh, fundamentalists or by other names, but uh, that does not mean that uh, when anybody talks about God, they are talking about this simplistic God. This simplistic God is, cannot be subject of scientific scrutiny. 
there's no need for that. Why are these scientists attacking it then? Because what has happened in the meantime, that there is now significant, very solid in fact, scientific data suggesting that there is a God which is scientific, quite sophisticated, philosophically and scientifically completely tenable. And it raises questions about the basic veracity of the scientific materialism that sciences use as their fundamental metaphysics. And it is causing, in my mind, in my opinion, a little scare in many scientists, and therefore that this is a preemptive strike against the new discoveries that are being made in favor of God, a scientifically tenable God, not that simplistic God. And what are those new scientific discoveries? Well, we have found the three basic agreements that spiritual traditions have about the nature of God, irrespective of what picture you have, simplistic or not. And these three basic tenets are all scientific tenets. One is that there is, apart from material cause, material interactions, there is another source of causation in the world. Now, just for naming it, we, we just name it as downward causation without any picture about it, no simplistic picture, please. This is just to contrast it from upward causation of the materialist, because in materialist uh, thinking, elementary particle interactions cause everything, all of the conglomerates that can be, that can be thought as cause moving up. Elementary particles make atoms, make molecules, make cells, make the brain, makes all of our subjective experiences. Cause move upwards from the elementary particles, which is the base level. Just to contrast it from upward causation, we call this new or old source of causation downward causation. So this every religion, every spiritual tradition should agree with. And we have absolutely convincing evidence that downward causation exists. So in upward causation, consciousness is an epiphenomenon of matter? Yes. Whereas in downward uh, causation... Consciousness uh, is, the, is the basic ground level of reality, ground of being. And what is the relationship between this consciousness and downward causation and matter? Well, uh, so uh, you require a little bit of quantum physics for understanding this clearly. Tell Let us. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Quantum physics says that objects are not determined things, as Newton thought. Instead, objects are quantum possibilities for consciousness to choose from. Now, if a consciousness is choosing quantum possibilities, actuality from quantum possibilities, then a specter can be raised that uh, what is the nature of this consciousness? If it is material, then a paradox takes place. How? Well, elementary particles make atoms, make molecules, make cells, make brain, make consciousness, put this in quantum language, then possible elementary particles make possible atom, make possible molecules, make possible cells, make possible brain, making possible consciousness. How can possible consciousness looking at possible elementary particles give you anything actual. So this is a specter and this is true. This is a paradox. Um, how does one solve this quantum measurement paradox? So um, one of the wisdom is that leave consciousness out of the situation. Because um, if you say consciousness has a non-material component, as von Neumann suggested, then again a paradox, how does a non-material uh, entity and uh, uh, interact with a material entity. It it's, 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 uh, requires exchange of signals which carry energy, but energy of ev anything uh, that is physical, energy of the physical universe is always a constant. Energy never comes into the physical universe from any other universe, nor does energy go out of the physical universe to any other universe. So uh, dualism, this, uh, this philosophy which is called dualism, is not a tenable philosophy, not a scientifically tenable philosophy. So either way you look at consciousness, 
If you look at consciousness as material, you get a paradox. If you look at consciousness as non-material, you get a paradox. So the idea was um, very, very confusing. How can our looking produce actual events of experience, convert the poss possibilities and actual events of experience? And, 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 and this just creates a knot of thought which has been very difficult for scientists to solve. Two decades ago, this problem was solved by recognizing that there is another way of thinking of consciousness. And this is consciousness as the ground of all being. This is esoteric tradition of spirituality, not the popular tradition. But this thought is there in the esoteric tradition since millennia. The thought was rediscovered in the context of quantum measurement problem because it solves the paradoxes. How? If you think of consciousness as the ground of being and material possibilities are possibilities within that consciousness, then consciousness can choose one of the facets of the possibility and make it into an actual event of experience, but this does not involve dualism because consciousness is choosing from itself one of its own facets. Does not require any interaction, does not require, does not fall into the uh, paradox of dualism. So it's a nice, neat solution. And when you look into the details of uh, consciousness in this way, we find the neatness even expressed even better. This consciousness is a non-ordinary state of our consciousness, not the ordinary state of our consciousness where we feel individual, but instead, this consciousness is non-local. It's not individual, it's cosmic. What do you mean by non-local? Non-local means, uh, for all uh, future references, a communication that does not require energy, requ energy producing signals, energy involving signals, a signal-less communication that is non-locality. It's an interconnectedness which does not require any signal to produce communications within it. Must there be space and time for this to work? Uh, no, this is outside of space and time. That is the crucial point. In space and time, as Einstein showed a long time ago, this is part of his theory of relativity. In space and time, every communication requires a signal that carries energy. This is outside of space and time. So uh, this way of, of thinking, in fact, quantum physics um, in this way, requires that there is reality outside of space and time. Dr. Kaswami, talk to us about subtle bodies and the evidence for them. What are subtle bodies? Subtle bodies are called subtle because we experience them differently than we experience the material bodies, which are called gross. Material bodies, we see ourselves separate. We see material bodies as external to us, whereas subtle bodies, we experience them internally. We have experiences of feeling. We have experiences of thinking. We even have experiences uh, that are so subtle, we call them intuition, and we debate as to their nature. We don't quite know what they are. But as the uh, psychologist Carl Jung has codified, we really do have these four domains of experience, sensing for the outside objects that we call material, then feeling, we feel energies, but these are not physical energies. These are called vital energies. We feel energies at different parts of our body that Easterners call chakra. Along the meridian, there are seven major chakras that people today are very familiar, and we feel feelings there. Then there is the mind and associated thinking. We have the experience of thinking. And as I said, very subtle experience of intuition. What do we intuit? We intuit archetypes, to use the language of Plato. Archetypes such as truth, beauty, justice, love, and good. So four kinds of experience, four kinds of possibilities in consciousness. When consciousness chooses from this possibility, 
The actuality brings about an experience of sensing, if it's a material actuality. If it is a vital energy actuality, then that would be the feeling of energy, vital energy. If it is a thought that is coming into experience, that would be a mental experience of meaning. And if it is the intuition that we are experiencing, then that would be, the object would be a supramental archetype. So in this way, the subtle bodies can be defined very clearly. And if a materialist says, materialists have two objections against this. Well, one is dualism. Dualism is that old objection, how does a non-material body interact with a material body? And what they say is that uh, since such interaction is impossible, Therefore, these uh, non-material bodies have to be material. They, they don't deny the experience. They only say that, well, they have to have material origin. But quantum physics shows that dualism now can be bypassed because how do these objects interact? Well, they interact not directly, but through the intermediary of non-local consciousness. Conscience, consciousness uses non-locality, which does not involve any signals. And therefore, uh, the argument about dualism, the paradox of dualism, is completely avoided. Quantum physics allows us that. So that old dualistic argument against Descartes' idea of mind separate from matter has already been removed. And one shouldn't be afraid of scientists because of their argument of dualism. And again, are these things material? For example, is thought, mind, is this non-material? Or is, can, can brain, material brain explain thoughts? This is a very important point. And scientists, again, have made huge progress in this regard. When, art, uh, when uh, artificial intelligence research came about because of the advent of computers, one of the things people try to do is to uh, produce intelligent computers. And indeed, in the 80s, you could call up a number in Canada and you could talk to a California psychiatrist, quote unquote, with the touchy-feely psychobabble of the day, later to find out that you were talking to a computer program. But John Searle, a philosopher, and Roger Penrose, a physicist, they showed conclusively that this does not tell you the whole story. Yes, a computer can fool you with content, which is programmed into the computer. But there is something more than content in a thought. Just as a sentence has syntax and semantics, two aspects, similarly a thought has content, but also meaning. And the meaning level is impossible to process with a computer, which is a symbol processing machine. So in this way, the proof is now very mathematical and very definite that a computer cannot process meaning. If a computer cannot process meaning, and brain is a computer, then brain cannot process meaning either. What processes meaning? Mind processes meaning. What is the brain's job? Brain makes representation of mental meaning, just as a computer makes representation of mental meaning that we give to the computer. So in this way, we, have now, uh, we are now beginning to understand the nature of the subtle bodies better also. So are there evidence for these subtle bodies? Is there evidence for the mind being uh, affecting our lives and so forth? Yes, there is tremendous evidence. In the, in the past few decades, we have had uh, very solid evidence, first of all, mind itself, if, you give, if we give wrong mental meaning to some of our experiences, it can be so severe that it can produce disease of the physical body. And when we correct the mental meaning, then indeed the physical body is back to healing. It heals itself. So in this way, the evidence is now very, very clear. But even more solid evidence comes from the phenomenon of reincarnation. In reincarnation, we find evidence that although the physical body dies, but the subtle bodies live on. 
in the sense that they can be reincarnated later in some future physical body. How do we know that this is a reincarnation of a previous body? This is where Ian Stevenson, a University of Virginia uh, psychiatrist, has uh, done enormously useful research. He has shown that uh, children often remember stories and anecdotes, episodes from their past lives. What Stevenson has done, he has verified some of these stories. He has taken them seriously, and he has verified some of these stories. And some of them are so striking that you just have to agree that there is something here that That's cannot be explained away. I'll give you an example. Um, there was a little girl who was uh, having reincarnational memory of a nearby village where she lived in the past life. Now, uh, this girl is born of a poor family, so she had never been to that village. But when Stevenson heard the story, she said, OK, I'll take you there. Let's see, see what you can remember, if you can find the house and all this. So they went. And after a while, the girl was able to identify a house. This is the house she lived. And then she remembered something, that there is a hidden compartment in the house. In that hidden compartment, there was some money. So Stevenson went into the house, uh, took the permission from the present owners, and indeed they found a hidden compartment, just as the girl described how to find it. And in that hidden compartment, there is money. And guess what? The money is actually the old money that would correspond completely authenticate the girl's story. So in this way, and you have to really read um, Stephenson collected some 2,000 uh, case histories like this. And every one of them he verified directly by going into the place where the memory, memory was about and all this. The details are so wonderfully checked out and so thoroughly carried out that uh, once you look at this data, you cannot doubt reincarnation anymore. Thank you.